Yes, hello. It's Jason Liu, and this is the Ultra Culture Podcast. And I just got out of a negative 220 degree Fahrenheit tank of freezing nitrogen. Yes, I have been sucked into yet another consumer fad, which is being uh, cryogenically frozen in a cryo tank. This is supposed to help with recovery. It was it was created for athletes for sports recovery. But the idea is that you stand in this tank, it pumps out freezing nitrogen gas, cools down the surrounding area to 220 degrees, negative 220 degrees Fahrenheit for about three minutes, um, during which time you're incredibly, incredibly cold, probably shivering and probably wondering why you've done this to yourself. After I got out of this, my skin was just my skin, obviously, not my core temperature was 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little frosty. So why? Well, this has been catching on in Los Angeles. And yes, I'm always a sucker for this type of thing. But if you know me, you know that any type of new technology for changing consciousness, extending consciousness, changing the body, uh, manipulating the human experience in any type of transhuman or posthuman way, I get really excited about, so I've got to at least try it. So I've been checking out cryotherapy, and it's actually really, really relaxing. Now, I checked out the scientific studies about it, and they're pretty inconclusive. They're not really sure that it does anything more than dunking yourself in a cold plunge. And it might, in fact, do less than dunking yourself in a cold plunge. But I love dunking myself in cold plunges. I think it's one of the most amazing ways to shock yourself into present awareness there is. In fact, I'll go into cold plunges and immerse myself for five minutes at a time until I'm shivering and my lips are blue. Uh, I don't know how healthy this is. But, man, if you want to wake up into present awareness right now, that's a great way to do it. So I've been really enjoying cryotherapy, and there's another kind of adjacent technique, which is called air therapy, sometimes called compression therapy, where if you go to these centers that are are sprouting up where they do cryotherapy, they usually have air therapy also. Uh, And basically what that is, is a body sock uh, that you put on and that inflates with air and compresses uh, parts of your body very, very hard. It feels kind of like being massaged by four people at the same time. And man, that one really, really works. Uh, I feel amazing right now. I did it maybe five minutes before hopping on to record this intro, and I feel great. I felt half dead before uh, going to do this because being an entrepreneur is hard work, especially when you're also supposed to be a writer and a podcaster. So those have been some really interesting kind of helping technologies that I've been into in the last couple weeks that have been helping me go full steam ahead, producing more podcasts for you, writing, and working on some radically exciting new material at magic.me. So today's guest is a very special friend of mine, Duncan Trussell. You probably have heard the, I think now five shows, uh, five interviews I've done on his podcast. Uh, and Duncan is an awesome, awesome guy. You don't need me to tell you that. He's, he's very popular, and if you don't know who he is, you certainly should. So we did a podcast just a few days ago at Duncan's house, uh, which has already aired, uh, the topic of which was enlightenment, reincarnation, and the Tibetan bardo experience. This one was a bit more casual. We decided to do a follow-up just a few days later at my house for my podcast, and uh, I was able to lure Duncan over with the the promise of my Mexican cooking, which is uh, pretty good, I do have to say. I'm, I'm humble about most things, but my cooking, no. My cooking is amazing. I, I'm just going to throw that out there. So we had a pretty relaxed conversation, as you might imagine, after you know polishing off some amazing salmon tacos and a bottle of wine. But we covered some good territory in this one. We talked about how Duncan got interested in the esoteric side of things when he was a teenager. We talked about the grim slavery type nature of our economic system. We talked about the future of automation and AI and all kinds of other topics. Of course, magic came up quite a lot since it's a mutual interest of ours and we focused a lot of the conversation on that. So strap in, 
You're really, really going to enjoy this conversation. And speaking of magic, if you haven't already, definitely sign up for the free 10-day magic class at magic.me, my online school for magic, in which I teach chaos magic, ceremonial magic, astral projection, tarot, I Ching, uh, magic as a life path, all kinds of great, great material. You can get that class for free by texting the word shaman, S-H-A-M-A-N, to the phone number 44222. That's if you live in the United States. If you don't live in the United States, you can go to the web address free.magic. That's magic with a K, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. So free.magic.me slash offer. Free.magic.me slash offer. And you can sign up for the free course. So the future is looking bright for the podcast. Lots of new episodes coming up. If you haven't already subscribed to the show, please definitely do so. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and, and lots more. You can find all of the links for those at the podcast website, which is jasonlouvecom slash podcast. And of course, if you want to keep this podcast going and you want to keep supporting it and you want to make sure new episodes keep coming and I keep you know, uh, being able to spend the time improving the quality and the equipment and all that, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can also do that at jasonlouvecom slash podcast. And supporters get a lot of really exciting perks, including advanced access to interviews. Uh, in fact, I uploaded this interview with Duncan, just the raw audio, as soon as we had finished recording it. So it's already been up for Patreon subscribers for a while now. And uh, yeah, uh, supporters get advanced access to that. They also get access to the Discord and special status on the Discord. Uh, the Discord community has been going really, really strong. People talking about all kinds of magic and esoteric stuff and even, you know, coming up with group projects to do and and sharing art and, and you know, magic inspired art. It's a really, really thriving scene. I'm really excited about it. Uh, we've got close to 2000 members on it already. So um, that is another great perk you get as a supporter. You get special status on the Discord including access to a supporters-only forum on the Discord where you can make requests uh, about the podcast, and I will be monitoring those very, very closely. Okay, so with no further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy an awesome conversation with the one and only Duncan Trussell. Okay, how's it going? Great, man. Really good. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for cooking this incredible dinner for me, Jason. It was amazing. So, yeah, Duncan and I are, are hanging out, and I've just made amazing, if I do say so myself, salmon you tacos. You should pat yourself on the back. It was great. Yeah, delicious. Beautiful. Meticulously prepared. I didn't know you were such a great cook. I said, Jason, you're a great cook. And his response was, well, you know, I just follow the directions on the recipe. Well, that's what I do. You know, isn't that what a great cook is? Well, I guess. I mean, don't you have to have like a, a huge ego and do like a whole tour and have a book out and have like a whole drug habit that you go through, but then you get a, t a deal for a TV show about your life or a movie? I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things where with cooking, with is in particular with cooking, you've got all these like what, I mean, what a perfect. It's so. I guess you could say analogous for magic isn't it like you have this like pretty much or anything you have this step-by-step -step guide and ex except cooking versus like constructing ikea furniture there's the addition of fire and water and the elements you know when you're building ikea furniture they're not like you know heat this rod to 300 degrees for seven minutes so it will poison you it's like you know it's a little bit uh, less involved, which is why cooking is such a amazing thing in the sense that if you just follow the directions, you're going to make something incredible. But there's so many chances in a recipe to fuck up too much, <laughs> right? Like so many chances. That's true. That's true. Well, that's where practice comes in, you know? And, and yeah, I guess now that you're relating this to magic, this is how I approach magic. And it's really how I approach everything. It's like uh, Crowley talks about in book four, 
you know, what's the magical way to open a door? Well, you go over and you turn the handle. So for me, if I want to do something in my life, let's say I want to manifest money or I want to manifest uh, a new website or I want to manifest a, a relationship, you know, or, or whatever it is, maybe it's something simple. Like recently I've been really into AI and automation. So it's like, I just want to automate my life. I want to autom- have a, an automated home. Yeah. Well, Google had to do it. Find someone who's written a blog post with the instructions and then hopefully, and, and, and then with Reddit, we can do the most upvoted post or you know, yeah. some, some places have upvoting systems. That's very helpful. Find the best rated, uh, uh, recipe for how yes. to do that. And then just follow the directions and magic yeah. is like that also, you know, it's like, we'll just follow the fault. If you follow the directions in some grimoire, you'll probably get the result at the other end of it. Yes, but you got to follow them. And then the, the, that's the thing that I love about directions, instructions is that it's a perfect mirror for the whatever patterns in your life are working and the patterns in your life that aren't working. You can really see them laid bare and assembling this thing or that thing based on a set of very simple instructions. Cause you know, you're going to want to, first of all, like you can tell a lot about a person if there's a thing that they're supposed to construct and they start doing it without the instructions, which is a classic, then you know a lot about them. And one thing you know is they think they know more than the instructions. They think that they have like an intuitive ability to to do whatever it is you know usually it's furniture sometimes it's some other thing they think it's simple you know they think usually this stuff's easy and i can do it now are they right that'll tell you another thing about themselves which is that about that particular person which is if minus the instructions they create a thing from the pieces that is the thing they wanted to create then they were right but if there's like three extra screws, a wobbly side of the wonky thing, and and then then they're gonna either disassemble it and look at the instructions and reassemble it, thinking, you know, I was wrong, or they're gonna do what a lot of us do, which is deal with a wobble. And then you look around wherever they live and you realize, oh shit, everything here is shoddily constructed. Everything here has got a wobble in it. And then you see how the reflection of that wobble within themselves, which is just hubris, is literally being engulfed by matter around them in the form of every single thing they try to make has become pregnant with their hubris. And the children it gives birth to is mild moments of inconvenience. Right. Well, this is interesting, right? Because it's now been, what, like three days since we did a podcast at your house, yes. right? And now the tables have turned, D. Trussell. Now you're Shit. in my sorcerer's lair. I I've like lured it. you into my web with the offer of free food yeah, and I, fish tacos. And now takes. you are in my sorcerer's lair. Yeah. But you were talking about in that podcast about the idea that there's a wobble, that there's kind of a wobble in. Wobbly wheel. Wobbly yeah. wheel. And I don't think there is a wobble. Oh. I think that the wobble is in our perception, right? And, and that actually the concept that there's something wrong with the world or that something is off or of course as the great Leonard Cohen put it put it there's a crack in everything that's how the light gets in yeah this is a very Kabbalistic concept the idea that there's something inherently broken about reality it's not quite right yeah it's like that Japanese uh, art form where you break a ceramic pot and then you I think it's called sumai sumai or something I may have that wrong but there's a Japanese art form where you break a pot but then you Re, re reassemble it and then you seal the cracks with gold cool and it's considered to be more beautiful than before it was broken yeah but my perspective particularly from doing a lot of enochian is that reality is perfect the only wobble is in our perception we're the only wobble is that we're perceiving it as imperfect yes. but that's actually a perceptual blind spot it's not imperfect at all okay so i think that that is probably in an unskillful way what I I was meaning to say and the um but but again it's like okay well our perceptual framework right so so our perceptual framework has a wobble in it the reality tunnel our ability to perceive reality has thank you has become wobbled by our attachment to an outcome for me it's like the the non 
lofty way to describe it is like at some point you will realize that when you call your cable company to get the problem with the cable fixed, it's probably not going to work. Like at some point you'll realize that when you call whatever the thing is with a long hold time, it's just, it's, it's not going to work most of the time. Like it might work here and there, but most of the time it's going to take longer than you wanted it to. There's going to be something that you don't have for them at the moment that they need. You're going to get disconnected. Something's not going to work. And to me, that's dukkha. And the dukkha is certainly not to say that, well, the bureaucratic framework of whatever the specific corporation that I'm trying to interface with to get this thing or that thing is imperfect, which it may be or not be, may not be. The thing that's imperfect is that my expectation is that this is going to work out. In the moment that I give that expectation up and I'm sitting on the phone with this thing or that thing, I'm pressing the buttons that I'm supposed to press and it gets disconnected, the more attached I was to the idea that this was going to work this time is how much I'll suffer. Hmm. So that's dukkha, wobbly wheel. It's like you want to find the imperfection in the system. I can find imperfections in systems. It's pretty easy to do. I mean, you can see it in anything, you know, on a small level. There's static in the TV. There's a buzz in the line. There's a curvature to the spine. There's a problem with the optic nerve or the genetics of a animal or a human or whatever. And you could say, oh, that's not perfect. It's not ideal. I would love to be have perfect vision and a non-curved spine. Ah, uh, yes. Well, speaking of a curved spine and genetics, ladies and gentlemen, we've extracted Duncan from his mandala. Hare Krishna. We have taken Duncan, a, a very a very sincere bhakti yogi and a practitioner of the mystic path and taken him far from his normal habitat into the dark towers and the basalt monoliths of the sorcerers. <laughs> so now, Duncan, you are sitting in the... Imagine yourself high in the, the German Alps in, uh, in, uh, in the alchemical chambers of the black wizards. Yes. Far from home. Yes. Interesting. Now we will see. So, Duncan, tell I wanna, me. First of all, before we get into that, I want to know what a fucking basil monolith is. Is that a, what do you mean? Is that something like a go, go blecky tepi? Is that like, do you mean like a. Just picture, you know, if you went to Antarctica and discovered evidence that a civilization had been here before humanity that's where we would be right now it's my favorite hp lovecraft there you go. story the mountains <laughs> of madness those poor poor scientists okay so here we are very big inf influence on the movie prometheus i love that movie the, the screenplay yeah. was terrible but man the aesthetics were awesome so yes the, okay so i got the, it we're the black like, basalt monolith oh beyond the, the stars the the, the, the the twisting spires of the mountains the the that, that, those have got to be that that's not made by fucking a wind that clearly was carved by an ancient hand mm. that preceded humanity by millennia okay cool <laughs> i like i'm glad i'm here yes some cyclopean non-euclidean geometry crafted this Blasted, dense broken guilds alt, ultra dark Wherever it is that we happen to be, you got a pretty cozy. I mean, I don't want to fuck time, this up, but you got a pretty cozy apartment. Time. Yeah, it's just it's just a nice apartment with some IKEA furniture. <laughs> That's true. I, you know, psychically though, different, right? Psychically, got, got it. There's some psychic <laughs> basil monoliths <laughs> protruding from the metaphysical architecture of this dome of darkness. <laughs> I wish there were IKEA monoliths. You know. Yeah. Ikea, Ikea is a little Lovecraftian, right? Like all those umlauts and stuff. Like weird <laughs> names for things. It's Lovecraftian in the sense that the fucking instructions act like a necronomicon. <laughs> yes, yes. You will end up a oh jabbering, drooling, mad <laughs> fucking air. What have I done? Not the thing that lives behind the parka ponks. The thing, <laughs> that, the thing behind the crap slot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the weird, you get the screw, you get the, 
like the weird Allen wrench, but the end of it is like some bizarre sigil you've never seen. Yes. Like, how does this weird, like 18 sided star fit into this screw from the oh, Allen yeah. wrench? Yeah. Ikea real shit. So how did you get interested in magic Duncan? Oh man. How did that happen? You know, I was just actually writing about this. Um, how I was at Walden books and, um, you, you know, what happens is like, you're pissed, like you're in high school, you're pissed, you're pissed You're in high school. It's the God, I guess it's the late eighties, nineties. I'm pretty old. I'm 44. So whenever a 44 year old would be in high school, you're pissed. If you're me, you know, you're like, you want, you want some control. You know, you, you, you want the idea that there's got to be something more than this, you know, the, the, the mall, the divorce, the brother, the little house on Greenleaf Drive in Fletcher, North Carolina, the sense of failure of everything being like a kind of, you're like sort of a sentient pebble in some kind of horrific genetic avalanche that's pouring down the sides of time. And so you're like, fuck, man, there's got to be something like, you know, you do the, you meet with the um, school guidance counselor and you fill out that very depressing, like, well, what are your interests thing? And it's like, they're like, uh, you know, based on this, it looks like you might be good in management. And you're like, I don't think, I don't know that my, I want to do management. I'm not even sure what that fucking is. You might be a good publicist. You might be good at PR. Whatever. Your parents are desperately trying to like figure out if you're retarded or crazy. You're this is the war on drugs. I think I had maybe just discovered LSD, thank God. So at least there's the gospel of LSD minus the internet. So you really think every time you're taking it that you're giving yourself brain damage. And you don't care because you'd rather have that kind of brain damage than the brain damage of the shuffling zombies you're seeing at the Blue Ridge Mall going up and down the escalator. And also it's like, fuck, look at the way the tiles breathe, (laughs) man. That's amazing. So Walton Books, Necronomicon. Remember that book, The Necronomicon? Oh, yeah, I've still got it. Yeah, yeah. So here's this book, The Necronomicon. You know who wrote that, by the way? No. Jim Wasserman. No fucking way. Yeah, Jim Wasserman and I think one of the guys who worked at Magical Child in New York uh, just drank a bottle of Jack Daniels and wrote that as a joke in the 70s. He talks about it in his biography. Absolutely. But I digress. Brilliant. Brilliant to write that because it's like what you do is you do this analysis of culture. You know, fucking make a thing that the parents aren't going to want you to buy and aren't going to want their kids to buy and certainly like put within it like the potential that it could cause some kind of like long-term magical psychic damage from fucking around with it. And boy, that's going to be like a gravity well for a teenager who's like, Oh shit, I got to have this. So I think I bought the Necronomicon and was reading it. I guess maybe where Wasserman is like, where it's a little unethical is, you know, I don't think these people understand just how desperate young people are to escape the reality tunnel that they're in. In in any way you can get out, you know, you, and again, you, I just sound so victim-y there, but you're just looking for a way out. So this is the fucking Necronomicon. I'm going to get some power or something. I think I went out into the woods with some candles. I think I jerked off reading some of it. Like I'm out there in the woods jerking off. <laughs> Thank God no one walked. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking of like, I was writing about how funny it would have been if someone just on a nice like North Carolina night walk just stumbled upon some ah, there's the trussles boy confused trussle jerking <laughs> off to a fake magic book <laughs> so that was like you know that was uh the um that was the first time I, i'd really like played around with magic and and uh of course there was very little that came from that outside of it you know fun story and it's funny because i have interviewed wasserman and i remember telling Wasserman something along the lines of like, you know, this, I never really had these summoning rituals work as far as like conjuring entities. He's like, keep trying. I just didn't know he was the guy who wrote the book that I jerked off to when I was in high school. So I guess it did work, but it's a long, conjured him. It's a long burn, (laughs) slow burn. (laughs) So, you know, that was the, the first uh, time the, the 
really, I think the like I, I I've I've had different moments in my life where I've begun to look at that particular what do they call it esotericism. I've I've looked at it and studied it a little bit, and um, certainly had a few different rituals that I think went a little better than the Wasserman Necronomicon ritual to the point where I um, no longer uh, practice that style of ceremonial magic, you know? Right. Uh, you you seem to have moved on very much to the Eastern path and the, the devotional path. Yeah. Only just because like, I'm just too, my, um, I, ideas early on of what I wanted were really not based on what I actually wanted, but they were based on shit I'd seen in movies. So, you know, even my desire mechanisms had been in fa- I'd been infected with certain types of desire by much more powerful sorcerers than me who told me that I, you know, here's what success looks like. You know, it's a whatever, you know, you, you we can all kind of like just watch any fucking lifestyles of the rich and famous and you can see like a spell that's been cast in the minds of so many people who imagine that like the height of success is to have some sprawling edifice with standing pools of water they can swim around in basalt monoliths yeah but no 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 <laughs> basalt monoliths that's your version of success it's like <laughs> <laughs> the the mansion in Beverly Hills, but with basalt monoliths carved with sigils carved uh, yeah, all over them. Yeah. yeah, lifestyles of the of the of the rich and, and magical maybe yeah. those basalt <laughs> monoliths. But you know what I'm saying? Like we've all been colonized to some degree to the point where one of the most depressing things anyone can ask some of us is, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And like here's this like kind of like bunched up older person who's clearly miserable in some shitty office who's making state salary for being a guidance counselor asking you what you want to be when you grow up this person is like you know i'm not saying all guidance counselors don't want to be guidance counselors but certainly the one i had at west Enders in high school he looked like he'd been staring into a fucking sarcophagus filled with like lich fetuses for the last couple of fucking years you know what i mean he didn't look like whatever he is didn't look like it worked out for him what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, I don't fucking know, man. Am I supposed to know that? What I want to be when I, quote, grow up? You mean, how do I want to plug myself into this, like, machine that seems to have be mid-process ripping you a new fucking asshole? You know, you see, so you get that funny feeling when you're a teenager in the pit of your stomach. Yeah, they asked me that question. I remember very clearly, 10th grade, guidance counselor, they asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I'm not sure yet, but something creative. And they said, oh, military photographer. Mm, there you <laughs> go. Of course. That's that's great. Yeah, you take pictures of war. That's good. So, you know, if you either, you, you we as, as kids, you end up having to navigate a, a maze, a hedge maze made of fucking zombies, mostly, you know, like moaning zombies. You're like, oh, hello, man, follow the and you're in this maze and you're like, ah, fuck, you know, this young friend of mine, I got to send him a, I got to compose a reference for him, this kid. And, you know, he's right in the hedge maze, right? So he's still got to do the thing. He's got to go get credentialed. You know, that's a, that's a big part of it is uh, I love, there's a great book um, called Bullshit Jobs by Graber. Mm. And it talks about, and I don't know if it's Bullshit Jobs or the Utopia of Rules. I can't remember which one it is he wrote, but it kind of talks about the um, credentialing in our culture. So it's like a, a lot of, of a lot of credentials people have to get are unnecessary credentials. But the credential to get the credential, you have to get in debt by taking right, out right, loans. Right, 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 right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like you have to. You basically have to hawk yourself to the system. Yes. Right? It's like you have to you have to voluntarily take the noose and put it around your neck as symbolized by the tie. Yeah. Right. It's like, okay, here's the the manacles. I put them on my hands. And the yeah. debt, of course, is you voluntarily enslave yourself to society. That's right. I'm really grateful that I figured that out really young. And so I live my life in a way that like I went to 
you know, a cheaper college. I, you know, I did everything I could to stay away from debt. And then I kind of carved my own path. Yeah. I see that you do that, like being at your house and looking at how everything is like, you know, definitely dialed in, in this like really efficient way. It's pretty cool to see the way that your practice is manifesting around you. And yeah, that's, that takes discipline, man, you know, and, and a real strong mind to, to not get fooled by some super powerful fucking um, organizations like the oh, Ivy, yeah. Ivy League schools. My God, man. Their PR team has done such a good job. I'm fucking Ivy League, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford. Ooh, I'm going to get a scholarship to a blah, 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 and this and that. But the real, bo- like, you know, like, let's imagine you decided to start a, um, I don't know, a butcher shop, right? And you want to start selling meat. And you already do have to get credentialed to do that, right? You have to get a butcher's license. You have to know you can handle. There's all these credentials you've got to get. But, you know, let's imagine that suddenly I come by and I'm like, yeah, but have you gotten you a fucking diploma of meat? And you're like, no, what are you talking about? Like the meat diploma. Do you want to get the meat diploma or not? And you're like, no, I don't want to. Then you can't fucking sell meat, right? (laughs) And, 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 And you can't sell meat on my street, bitch. Fine, I want the fucking diploma. What do I have to do? That's four thousand dollars to get a meat diploma, and I'll rush you through the classes. Okay, it's manual. You sign a couple of pages or whatever. So now we end up with this like, yeah, it's like these credentials that we have to get are we have to get credentialed. But really, it's like you're saying, it's just like a payoff to uh, right. organize crime. Yeah, it's it's like a protection racket. Yeah, it's a protection a racket. And in, in, in the name of protecting all of us from charlatans, which we need. That's the problem. It's a double-edged sword. I Let me tell you, when I go to a doctor, you know what I don't do, though? It's so funny. I probably should. I don't check the credentials of my doctors. <laughs> Like when I go to a doctor, I, just, I check Yelp reviews. I check Yelp. That's it. Yeah. I, I certainly don't like when when I see their diploma, I don't look like, the, dude, somebody could literally just like print out diploma Stanford and stick it on their fucking wall. And I'm going to let them at least cut a mole off my body. It's so funny, too, because we know just from, you know, hearing interviews of people and things like that, that everyone suffers from imposter syndrome. Yes. You know, like at the same time that everyone needs to be credentialed, everyone feels like they're a fraud. Yes. What is that, you know? And but I think this is such an important point that you're you're laying out here, which is and this was so much the case for me when I was a teenager also, which I, you know, my my getting into magic is pretty much the same story as yours. And my sense of, OK, I have all these guns when you're that age, when you're any age, but when you're that age, you have all these guns pointed at your head. You know, you've got this. Uh, machine coming towards you trying to feed you into its gears yeah this well-oiled machine that's chewed up generation after generation yeah and um you know the clash has a great song about this called uh, the clamp down i think waiting for the clamp down off of london calling mm. and I, I can't quote it but please look it up it's about the it's about the experience of being a young man working at a factory and realizing that if you don't run as fast as you can, you will be there the rest of your life. Yeah. And you will not live your dreams. And you will not get the girl. You will be one of those broken guys in his 50s sitting at the plant, you know, on the on the assembly line saying like, oh, yeah, I used to have dreams once. Glug, glug, glug. Dude, Stan Hope's got the best joke. This is one of his best jokes. They've got that fucking stupid show, Scared Straight. But how they need to have a scared straight where they take a bunch of kids to a cubicle where some dude's been working on it for 20 fucking years. <laughs> it's like, look, look at me, kid. This can happen, too. You can end up fucking flitting and flopping away, trusting this dope and that dope just because they're domineering. And then, the, yeah, the next thing you know, man, you're fucking you're fucking you're making copies. You're making copies <laughs> forever. You're making copies forever. The scary thing about that, too, is, you know, it's so easy to go from there to being like, oh, the system's trying to keep you down. The man's trying to keep you down. You know who's keeping you down? Like the voice in your head that is constantly casting a spell on you of like, this is okay for now. I'm learning stuff. This is comfortable. This is reasonable. This is adult. This is responsible. I'm being an adult. I'm modifying what I wanted was in a kind of immature and I'm modifying what I'm doing to really, you know, really do my part. And then, then the hernia, you know? Yeah. Then the fucking hernia comes and, but you know, this is the scary, like, you know, in my, when I'm in in like a really paranoid conspiratorial moment 
and I think about the uh, Civil War, and I think about like you know slavery building so much of this country, and how a lot of the people who wrote the Constitution were uh, slave owners and like fucked up people, man, fucked up people, like uh, and and totally okay enslaving other people like that they yeah were, like i read recently thomas jefferson something like he had so many slaves but he kept a lot of them captive and had you know all these children with them that were you know he that were he also kept captive and it was like wow like thomas jefferson was basically joseph fritzel that guy in austria that kept his daughter in the basement yeah Do you remember that horrific story yeah it's absolutely like, holy shit like that's the guy that we like revere as the founding father i think jefferson was also humping some of his slaves too yeah 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 and which i'm sure wasn't just jefferson but and also i think they have like handwritten notes jefferson was making on based on like breeding patterns of the slaves and like the way to like Oof. breed slaves Jesus. and sell them off. So like, like, so, so, you know, we, we had these people who started the country who were, um, com very comfortable with slavery. Like they could go to bed at night in a big house, knowing that like there were huts or cabins where people that they had bought were living. And the way they rationalized it was, um, what's his name? Robert E. Lee, right? So Robert E. Lee, there's a, a there's a, a attempt by white supremacists or some faction of white supremacists to paint Robert E. Lee as some kind of good person. He didn't want slavery either. He's actually like didn't want it either. You know, like he is. The, it's like the idea of the South is like, you know, we don't want slavery. Got no one wants fucking slavery, but what we definitely don't want is the federal fucking government controlling us. It's slavery. Of course, it's bad, right? It's stupid. It's not true. And you read writing by Robert E. Lee, and he says shit along the lines of, "Listen, man, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, sure, of course, slavery is bad, but here's the thing: the slaves they need to learn from us, and when they've learned enough from us." And they're ready to function in this kind of sophisticated society. Of course, we're going to let them go. Right? So it's like the way to deal with the cognitive dissonance of capturing people and making them do your work is to imagine, wait, I'm not really their captor so much as their teacher. I'm instructing them in Western civilization in the form of, yeah, they, they do they pick cotton for me? Yeah. But you know what else they do? They learn English. From time to time, I give them a pithy quote from one of the great philosophers. <laughs> you know, oh, man. so that's the that's the so, but but still, you know, there's this, and, and which is why, and give them Christianity. I've given them Christianity. Yeah, and and in in one of the uh, in this great article I read on this, one of like the things that really fucked with the minds of people who had somehow managed to convince themselves that it was okay to keep slaves was during the Civil War slaves that made it to the north were fighting people in the south and so you'd be in the south giving like ha having this ridiculous concept in your mind that oh my god they love me so much i'm a good master to my slaves oh i've done so good they would never run that sounds like the standard american middle manager these days bingo that's it that's it. And so they were always horrified to see the slaves coming, shooting them with muskets. Like, wait a minute. I, I let you in the house sometimes. We gave you slices of pie from time to time. It was better than wherever you were. Wait, why are you shooting me? Wait, what does that make sense? So, so, so yeah. So like in my morning. I'm just imagining the, the, the standard company now. It's like, what, you know, like we have a, we give you like Applebee's gift cards. Health you insurance. Know? <laughs> Health insurance. Fucking uh, casual uh, Friday. <laughs> Casual Bir birthdays fun. where everyone comes out with the cake for the everyone in the office. I don't even understand. This is just I don't even understand, jo jo Joseph. What's happening here? I mean, God, we gave you a cake on your birthday. We came out and gave right. you. We gave you an hour staff break. karaoke nights. There's staff in an hour break, and so so. Anyway, the point is, you know, it's scary to think that like we're trying to come up with a way to. Uh, it's scary to think that we're trying to come up with a way to. Um, rationalize slavery you know and it's scary to think that um a lot of what we we so so but where it gets really scary is all right so so like i'm some kind of like sorcerer some crazy libertarian sorcerer 
who did create the Constitution and who did create a really great country that became a superpower. And I was one of the founding fathers, as they say. And I'm a slave owner. And I, but I, I, I do realize like this slavery shit is not a good look. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Yet, I think it's okay to have slaves, but not to capture them. So I need to come up with a way to make the slave come to me. Also, P.S., it's expensive to have fucking slaves. I got to build a house for them. I got to bring their food to them. When they get sick, I got to give them medicine. I got to protect my investment. So what's an evolution of slavery? It's like minimum wage. Now the slave comes to me. Not only does the slave come to me, but fucking, I get to, I'm interviewing slaves. Debt slavery. I don't have to buy the slave up front. The slave comes to me. I don't even have to pay the fucking slave for two weeks. So the slave comes to me. There's not even an initial investment of buying the slave. The slave comes to me, fills out some fucking paperwork. In two weeks, I have to pay him $400. And of that energy, they've made me $800 or $600 in burger sales, right? And then, you know, so in a conspiratorial moment, sometimes I think to myself, my God, is the entire fucking system just an evolution of slavery created by libertarian wizards trying to remove themselves of the cognitive <laughs> oh, yeah, dissonance I've had to, of enslaving? I've this many times. But here's the thing, right? Maybe you can cast light on this for me. So something I've been thinking about recently if you look back at all human history for the, I mean, we've been just in our private conversations been talking about reincarnation a lot, but um, in the majority of history, the majority of humanity have been slaves, right? I mean, it's a truism, but it's also true that every empire in human history has been built on the back of slavery. Yeah, sure. Right? The standard issue human experience is of slavery. Um, and there is, a, of course, is a, grad, uh, is a gradient of slavery and certainly the, you know, wage slavery, debt slavery is not nearly the same thing as involuntary, uh, uh, you know, slavery. Which we have right? now in the prisons. Uh, right. And in also lots of places in the world, there's still straight up human slavery. But we know, have parts, parts of Africa and also in Africa. prisons. Yeah, right. Yeah. And we have the largest prison population of any country. And also we have them working as slaves and also they're on strike right, right now. Right. But it's amazing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Right. It's like, yeah. And, and the idea that did slavery really go away or did it just camouflage itself differently? But also thinking about, you know, the whole concept of slavery, it's like, but then we look at our, our religions pass on the nobility of slavery. Christianity passes on the nobility of being a slave. Families teach each other to be slaves. Your parents teach you to be a slave in a way, right? You know, get a good job, you know, be a responsible, all of this, don't upset your boss, you know, values are passed on. Yeah. Um, uh, and then of course there are power dynamics wi- within the, you know, within families, uh, you know, the classic John Lennon quote, you know, woman is the slave to the slaves. Right. You know, so there's, there's, and then there's, so there's power dynamics within, pe- you know, within relations of people who have no relative yeah. power dominate each other to feel good about themselves. Yeah. Right. Um, now, in a way, the question is, you know, is the majority of humanity already predisposed to that or can this change? What would a world be like in which people were not slaves? Is it possible? But the thing that really messes with my head is to think about automation, right? Okay, well, now automation is coming and now sure. all of these jobs that people have been, you know, ex- people have expected, it's, it's almost like this. Automation is going to take out certainly every blue collar job, nearly every blue collar job and quite a few white collar jobs, starting with truck driver. That's the first thing that's going to go, which is the number one job in America. A lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers, lawyers done, right? You know, journalists, things, all kinds of stuff. You know, they've already got AIs that can write sports journalism and all this. So then my question is, you know, on earth, you could at least expect to be a slave, right? I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable expectation for incarnating on earth. You can at least expect a slave existence in which you can hopefully enjoy yourself on the weekends. Right. But now even that that's not a given because now we're going to have all these people with uh, whose labor is not needed. Yeah. And that they're talking about universal basic income and all of this stuff. And I think that we're about to I truly think that we're about to hit this curve of evolution where we just get hit in the face with automation, AI, virtual reality. Uh, some blockchain stuff, space travel, all of this great CRISPR, biogenetic engineering, 
reality is going to get so strange so fast and yeah. none of the old social roles or the old expectations are going to hold. And for guys like us who are used to, I mean, the whole idea of magic in a way is to decondition yourself from all of those social expectations and to free yourself from being a slave. Right. Sure. Um, so for, for, I think for guys like us, this is not so worrying in a way because we are good at kind of creating our own path. But for the majority of humans, I'm just, I'm very, very worried because what's going to happen? What, you know, what are people going to do right when you can't even rely on the basic standard issue, human experience of just being exploited for your labor and then creating whatever local culture you can on the weekends. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. That's the, it's the whole, like, this is like, I, I, I clear, this must be what have ins, is inspired the, uh, George R. Martin with this winter is coming shit. You know, it's like, well, all these like factions like fight each other. They're completely ignoring the fact there's like a horde of undead skeletons that's going to eventually come pouring into their continent. And the whole time they're just like fighting each other. It's right. like, what the fuck are you guys doing? It's like, do you not see what is on the, that we're on the precipice of not just the, full automation of just about everything and the subsequent identity crisis of, of an entire species that is up until this point based itself on either being a master or a slave. We're looking at all the other things that go along with that level of sophistication, which is that the moment we get to some certain level of, 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 of automation, then what, then, then, then I guess it gets to the point potentially where AI innovates, then where AI innovates, we're looking at the hockey stick model of singularity, uh, the potential singularity or the, and then when that happens, it, it really doesn't fucking matter about basic income because we have plunged so far ahead that what the, the world we're in is going to be so different than the world that we're in right now. And it's already happening. I mean, to me, like, I love looking at all the like different quiverings that happen based on the technological manifestation of the innate interconnectivity of our, uh, of everything. Right. So Twitter of course is a technological, the way I think about it is it's like when you have an invisible man or woman or jour or G or whatever, when you have an invisible thing, throw paint on the motherfucker and now you can see it. Right. And so this has been stories and originally. So then we have archetypes, right? So you have stories and the stories are like linguistic bits of paint falling on top of a metaphysical, mostly invisible structure based on the patterns of humanity. And it, suddenly now we have Baldur, or we have Zeus. Suddenly now we have like all the stories and all the myths and fucking Joseph Campbell going on and on about that shit. And so Stories were a form of technology that were revealing, manifesting, showing the unrevealed, right? Technology is doing the same thing where this, um, what was it? What's the term in Buddhism? And I always thought interdependence. Interdependency. So yeah, yeah, now suddenly technology is like this kind of like nano paint that's falling on top of this mycelial connective framework that is already there. But now we're seeing it in the form of Twitter, right? And now that we're all interconnected, we're lit. We've heard the story of the jeweled net of Indra. Now we're watching the tremblings of the jeweled net of Indra, right? Which is that now suddenly, like the, the way I put it is, and I really keep meaning to make this fucking chart because I think it's really important. But now it's kind of irrelevant because Mel Gibson is a thing of the past. But do you remember when Mel Gibson got pulled over by the cop? Oh yes, and went on the anti-Semitic yes, rant. Yes, indeed. So I was thinking, like, whoa, how? In different periods of history, how long would it take Mel Gibson to destroy his career, right? So, like, you know, in the 50s, how long would it take people to know that Mel Gibson was an anti-Semitic piece of shit? In the 30s, how long would it take to know that Mel Gibson was, like, at least had some anti-Semitic drunk streak in him? In the 20s, in the 1800s, how long during the Mongol Empire? How long before the Mongol Empire? And so we go all the way back to the point where it's like, at some point, Mel Gibson could go into a full-on fucking anti-Semitic rant, and it's going to take 100 years before anyone's going to know that Mel Gibson's an anti-Semite, and no one's even going to know who fucking Mel Gibson is anyway, and it won't even fucking matter, right? 
So now we exist in a time period where someone can destroy themselves instantaneously with a single tweet. Roseanne, all you have to do is be on enough Ambien, be enough slightly racist or not funny or whatever it may be, right, and tweet right, that right. fucking somebody looks like a fucking monkey from Planet of the Apes. Bam, you're That's gone. It. Forget yep. it, right? Instantaneous karmic feedback right and this is all technological disruptions based on the hyper interconnectivity that we're all experiencing but it's not just that roseanne if we had twitter back in the fucking 50s could have tweeted that fucking shit and people would be like that's the funniest thing ever you gotta you know what you mean by that roseanne because like back then there was fucking segregation People were using the, the 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 ethical framework for Western society was so fucked up that it was normal for people to be like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> where's the uh, white person's bathroom? Our fucking grandparents asked that question, probably, right? Mm. So, so what we have here is heightened hyper interconnectivity mixing in with an accelerated shift in compassion and ethics, and the two things are a bad mix, which means that within a five-month period, our entire species, or at least the part in the fucking internet, is suddenly dealing with the fact that potentially, potentially, the genetic random roll of the dice that produces the player character's genitals might not necessarily be the identity of the player character as far as gender goes. Just that question alone, we need hundreds of years to explore that question right yeah i always think about like right now there's this huge issue about identity politics and gender and people are freaking out about it and for me i just look at that and and i just think you know i mentioned this on the podcast before just you know look look crispr is coming you know like very shortly we'll be able to edit our genetic code at will and i of course have always been of the mind of look i mean like my primary teacher was genesis purage you know it's like i've always been of the mind of we should be able to be anybody we want to yeah. be. We should be able to customize and change our phys- sure. physical bodies as if this was Second Life or World of Warcraft and become, you know, I w- if, you know, as transhumanism rolls out, I'm probably continually going to be like first volunteer, you know, like I like the idea of being able to change myself. Third volunteer for me. Okay. That's probably smarter. You never know. Fifth. <laughs> Maybe 10 pioneers even. get arrows in their back. Yeah, I don't want no fucking pioneers get bat wings. It's like, you know what? I want a tits, not bat wings. No, I think I'm waiting. You for, wouldn't want bat wings a little bit? What? Not even a little bit. To be honest, wings? I'm going to pick bat wings before tits. So probably you if you know me well. But my point is like, yeah, you know, there's going to be some bat wings and tits. You could just turn yourself into the succubus from first edition Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. That, that Oh, God, everyone fucking wanted to fuck that. <laughs> but the point is, man, it's like we're, we're, we're looking at the, the, the thing that we're looking at now is, is, is a really brutal intermingling of two really great things, which is one. What we definitely want is a expansion of humans ability to be inclusive and to be open minded and empathetic. Right. We want that. That's good. I think that's always good. I think that's for for me, at least it's inarguably good. We want that. But then we also want time for people to like really understand what that shit means so that now if I've got some stubborn dope, who's got access to this hardcore technology that allows whatever data packet they put up to be replicated infinitely. And this poor dope in process, as we all are, uploads, tweets, some data packet, which is a fractal of their particular place right now in process. And that fractal is a racist place. That fractal is a misogynist place. That fractal is a place of hubris or pride or all the above and they tweet this shit and then because we're all interconnected they get swarmed upon by people who are like no 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 that's bad you must go and it's like fuck man the person like is in process i'm not saying we should have they should have full reign to be monsters or whatever it is but i'm saying when we get this mob justice mixed in with rapidly shifting ethical standards Mm. that are being technologically accelerated mixed in with hyperconnectivity 
that's a recipe for fucking disaster. Cause like, look, man, I, you know, like how, how does that Bob Dylan song go? Uh, how does it go? Like if you don't, you don't stand in the hallway, don't block out the wall. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. The order is rapidly changing. Na, 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 na. I don't know. I grew up with punks, so I anyway, skipped straight over this Bob Dylan the times to, they are to the Sex Pistols. It's this fucking Bob Dylan pre-internet song basically saying, hey, old people, get the fuck out of the way or you're going to get fucking bulldozed. Now, this is before the internet. Now we're seeing the, ball, but the fucking Bob Dylan song taking place in the form of people being swarmed before they've had time to even like think about like shit man i'm a fucking homophobic racist person who's been trapped in this thing that Mm. i got infected with by my parents and i'm just a robot and i'm gonna tweet some stupid ass shit and i'm gonna get attacked and that 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 mob justice thing it's great if we're getting rid of harvey weinstein right but what happens this is where it gets scary. When we, we were saying before, let's do the future talk. This is where it gets scary, right? So like Harvey Weinstein gets me too, right? Rightfully so. We've got, what is he? He's like Henry the fifth or eighth or which, I don't know which Henry. He's a fucking monster. He's a Hollywood fucking power mogul who's just fucking using his power dynamic to fuck people. Just to fucking, fucking, fuck. And you heard the tape and it's fucked, right? He's fucked. And so we got that fucking Harvey Weinstein. We all joined together and we got that motherfucker, right? And then another person. Well, now we got, we're using technology now, man. We got that motherfucker. Thank God. I mean it too. Bill Cosby, we took him off the fucking map thanks to Hannibal Burris, who's said about Bill Cosby, got picked up by a fucking supercomputer in someone's pocket and reproduced a million times. And now a dude who liked to put fucking quaaludes in people's drinks. At the very least, people know that now. We got him. We got him, right? And we now who else do we got? Now who else do we got? Now who else do we got? Now let's start going through people's timelines, right? That started happening. James Gunn. Yeah, James yeah, yeah. Gunn. Now let's go through their fucking, oh, James Gunn must be a fucking pedophile. Now, look, you go through James Gunn's timeline, and that, those are some really bad, crass pedo jokes, right? And one of my friends who was, molested as a kid said to me when i'm like yeah i think he's just joking my friend's like dude do you want that's like almost pedophile apologetics it's like normalizing pedophilia you start off by making jokes right so i don't know i didn't even think about it that way but now it's kind of like shit i guess i kind of see what you mean but fuck god forbid i had twitter back when i was in high school and someone took anything seriously that i was tweeting you know what I mean? So now we're looking at something. Okay, fine, though. James Gunn. I guess we lost the fucking director of a series I actually really like. That's fucked up. But this is where it gets really scary. What happens if there's a coup and Mike Pence, whoever, some fundamentalist mm, fucking, yep. some fundamentalist, um, what's the, the Handmaid's Tale style person, right. get, rises to power. And now... All the the Me Too people and all the leftists who are using the internet to try to mob justice people who probably deserve to be mob justice because we don't want a Cosby and we don't want a fucking Weinstein and maybe we don't want someone who do is doing kind of normalization of pedophilia, right? I don't know. I'm gun. I'm a little up in the air about. But like now, but what happens now when it's Whitley Brinst and all of his friends? The friends of Brent somehow he just manages to take power. And now they go through your fucking Twitter timeline. And guess what? You tweeted some shit that makes it seem a little bit like you're on the side of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Or you just tweeted some shit about the American flag not really meaning anything. Right? And now the entire structure of Me Too gets used by a fascist Mm -hmm. state. Well, this is what people never... People never think ahead, you know? It's like they, they never... One thing that I was taught really well by a great history teacher in high school is that every time the federal government gets power, it never goes away. So you don't want to keep ceding power just because you happen to feel that you're on the same team as the person who's currently in charge. Yeah. 
classic example is when Obama was president, not to overly politicize this conversation, but when Obama <laughs> was, was president, you know, he was laying down basically a precedent for fascism where he was laying down. It's like, okay, all of a sudden the NDAA, no freedom of assembly, uh, the NSA, he wiretapped the entire yeah. planet. Uh, drone killings of Americans, yeah. Americans on American soil or yeah. in foreign countries, like oh, yeah, every little. But but he's he's the good guy. He's Obama. Beautiful but it's like, man. look, all you have to do is sure, great. You know, Obama's great, but all you have to yeah, do he's, he's leaving keys in the box now. And and I remember telling people at the time, well, we don't know who's going to be in office next because all somebody has to come do is come along and turn the keys that were left in the box for them to turn in the nuclear launch box, right? And lo and behold, look who we have in office That's now. That's right. So it shocks me. It always shocks me to see people chomping at the bit to give their personal freedoms away, uh, whatever Dude. they happen to be, like just you know begging practically to have their freedom taken away. And this kind of brings this back to the idea of slave mentality um, and... It, and I think particularly for magical people, it is of the utmost importance to decondition themselves from slave mentality. The other thing that occurred to me, though, when you were just talking is um, about Twitter and things like that, is that one conclusion that I've come to is technology is manifesting for us all the things that the spiritual books promised and yeah. religion promised and the grimoires promised. For instance, podcast, podcasting. I was thinking the other day, like, what is podcasting? Podcasting is telepathy. You're listening to a podcast and you're replacing the thoughts in your head with the thought, the, the thoughts of somebody else. You're swapping thoughts with somebody else. Sure. Twitter is also Facebook, social media, like mass telepathy. You know, the idea that there was this great woo spiritual idea in the 90s that 2012 was going to come along and we were all going to become yeah. one organism and connected and all our thoughts would be connected. And people were like, that's crazy hippie shit. Well, how's it feel now? We're all completely connected yeah. by, as you said, the supercomputer in our pocket and we can't handle it. And for That's me, right. this is where spirituality comes in. You know, one compassion. thing is compassion, but even just the practical skills of meditation and focus and just being able to cope with a cacophony of voices like that. Um, Cultivating compassion. We didn't do that technologically. And, and 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 that's where the problem is. Is like we did all this other shit technologically, which is fucking incredible. It's like what, you know, this is like, you know, I I I sometimes I feel like lucky because I feel like I have one foot in the waters of like Ramdas and and like Eastern stuff. Not that Ramdas isn't from the psychedelic community, but he represents a kind of a, a shift towards you know um, towards the East, whereas Timothy Leary stayed with psychedelics and there's a, a beautiful thriving psychedelic community out there. And I, I like to think that I have a foot in that too. And I have lots of friends in that community who I have a great deal of respect for and who, who teach me a lot in the same way the Ramdas people teach me. And the problem for me, this is what I've realized that late in the game is that uh, as someone who will eternally love psychedelics is that, Early on in my use of psychedelics, like I was saying, like I'm taking fucking LSD, going to the mall, looking at people and saying, thinking to myself, my God, I don't know if that person will ever get better. Like the fear in that person's face, the obvious sadness like that, you know, when you're on LSD, in fact... This was like, this is like, I don't, don't do this, by the way. And I remember this is a thing I used to give advice to people like this when I was young, like fucking idiot, man. And it's really literally the worst advice you can give someone. So don't do this. But it's like, if you know, if somebody, if you think someone's cheating on you <coughs> and you guys are both on acid, ask them if they're cheating on you. You'll know the truth right away. But then you're going to be tripping. And they're going to be tripping, right? And you better fucking have spent months or years cultivating the ability to forgive them in that moment. Your intention, asking them if they're cheating on you, should not be some Jerry Springer shit so that you could be like, <laughs> you motherfucker, I knew it, you lying motherfucker. 
we know should what? we should pitch a show psychedelic Jerry Springer uh, confessions on huge hits of psychedelics. You don't want to, you know. It's like you you need to. The, the thing is, like the psychedelics are going to give you the sight of the master. Like you're mm. going to see the where the person is working, where their shadow might be, the mm. process that they're in, and you're going to see that in yourself. But if you don't have with that the ability to forgive yourself and to forgive them, they were just fucking human, man. Right. Then you are going to, you're going to run into like a really bad, bad moment. And, and, um, well, this is why psychedelics have to go with spiritual practice. They have to go with some process of cultivating wisdom. They have to go with even therapy. It's like, you can't like, this is, I see the, the mistake people making. They think that there's something inherently magical about the substance instead of seeing it as one tool in a much broader yeah. spectrum of, of, of therapies or, or spiritual yeah. practices right. or the broader process of them becoming a more human being. And I think that if the, psych- the psychedelic culture is to go forward, the emphasis has to be on that and, and spirit, the spiritual path and all of the stuff <laughs> around the psychedelic experience instead of you know, just taking lots of psychedelics and deciding you're the lizard king or a psychedelic warrior or whatever, or well, right. an alien or whatever it is. Well, that, that's you know. the, you know, you, you get stuck in the pattern. It, it's just the, the, it, I, you know, I have found, you know, first of all, most of the people in the psychedelic community who I've run into, especially these days, they have practiced compassion and now they call it psychedelic harm reduction or they, and so you, you, I, I've met so many sweet people who are in that school of, or in that practice. And they're so sweet, man. And so selfless. And I think back in my day that people were a lot at, more rough around the edges and they were a lot more like fucking gnarly about it because they literally thought they were like destroying brain cells when they were taking it because mm. there was no study out about it or they, that bullshit propaganda that got out. Like, yeah, yeah. If you take more than three hits ass, you know, you're legally insane. It was like that in magic too. you know, the occult community in the nineties, like people were scary. It was a scary place. It was the wrong side of the tracks. And now it's so popular and it's in a way magic is kind of going along for the ride with the psychedelic Renaissance or people are taking it more seriously and it's becoming yeah. a more popular thing. But man, in the 90s, like, huh, like the people into magic that I knew were like terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. I believe it. I believe it. You know, it's because it gives you a lot of power. It's like, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're given the they live glasses and you're seeing the thing and you're seeing. And when the problem is, it's like, <coughs> for me, I know, you know, when in, in, in uh, an LSD missionary or in a psychedelic missionary, maybe a magic missionary their intent in the beginning is maybe they want to improve the people around them or make the people around them suffer a little less with the healing that can come from psychedelics or the empowering that can come from a deeper understanding of the universe that certain magical systems can give them. But there is also a big kind of fun thing in just being like, I did a magic trick and showed right. you that I should, this is like, I I've been, I was actually wrote a song making fun of this shit. Like, I can think of at least like I know there's two hippie 60 songs just that are songs about like Jimi Hendrix. Are you experienced? It's like some dude wanting to get laid, asking a girl (laughs) if she wants to take acid. And then I think it's like Donovan's like hurdy gurdy oh man, my God. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's like you get all these <laughs> fucking songs or like fucking uh, Sid Barrett's like. Um, you know, these anthems of the psychedelic seducer or the psychedelic martyr who's like, I could see you, I could see right through ooh, everything you are, you do not that, and all of the power to show yeah. you the truth. It's like some some band assembled by a record company recording in a thousand dollar an hour studio, you yeah, know, trying to be psychedelic. But you want to be ever like, I love the. In, uh, the interview with the vampire um, series. Have you read that? Probably? Oh yeah, yeah. So, what was the name of the? What, what kind of goth do you take me for, Duncan? Of I'm course sorry. I've read what those an books. Forgive me, forgive me. <laughs> but what was the? So, so in the the very first. Uh, so it's we have Lewis and we have what's the name of the vampire that turned Lewis? Lestat. Was it Lestat that turned Lewis? And yeah. you turned Lestat Armand. Um, was it Armand? I, I think that's another vampire. Oh man. Okay, I guess I must not be. 
No, it too goes, much of but a if you look at the lineage, it's the queen of the damned. Armand, what, like I think Lestat. I think so. It's Lestat ends up getting. Um, his story is one where his the person who turns him into a vampire doesn't even tell him that there's other vampires. Hmm. The one who turns him into the vampire wants all this control over him because he's the one who gave him. The oh, lineage. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. And so you run into that with psychedelics. You can and you can run into that with magic sure. and you can run into that with gurus and you can run into that with bhakti yoga for sure. But the Internet has changed all of that. I mean, it's like all of that stuff is a relic from a time when people didn't have free access to information. I remember when I was first getting into this stuff, it was fucking hard to find information. I didn't you know, all the information I had access to was a few books at Barnes and Noble. And I didn't even get access to anything good until I had to go to even as a teenager, I had to go to UCSD special collections. And like, who's going to do that? You know, yes, I, I had to go to university libraries to get information. It was very hard. And the people that you met were exactly the, like what you're talking about. You know, it's like they it was still possible in the 80s and 90s to have information that other people did not have that therefore made you special. That's right. And it might not have just been this, this. It might have been like you might have had a 12 inch for some obscure band that no one had ever heard of. Yes. And you could put that on and all of a sudden everyone was like, whoa, you discovered wow. fire. You know, you've got a birthday party, 12 inch that no one's ever heard of this band. That's right. But I still have it. There you go. Nick Cave's first band. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. That, and that was another form of power. It, yeah, absolutely. Information power. And but this, now it's democratized. Yeah. It's Well, it's, it, yeah, it's just there for us. It's all out there. And then, but still, you know, I mean, you know, and this is, I was interviewing Will Oldham. who was just talking about the tyranny of the algorithm and the way it's just basically like robbed us of that beautiful joy of the, per, like, I, you know, when do you ever forget for me, maybe, I don't know for you, but I'll never forget the first time my friend played Daniel Johnston for mm. me and Sebado for me. And I've got a hilarious story about meeting Daniel Johnson, but Johnston, I've heard many, but, yeah. but like the, 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 anyway, the point is like that, you know, those, 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 those days are still here a little bit, but the, the main point is that people who are going to practice magic, people who are going to get into psychedelics, people who are going to get into technology, because technology, Timothy Leary said, the internet is is this generation's LSD. People who are going to like get into this stuff, they need to at least try to be kind. Like the Dalai Lama says, kindness is my religion. And it's like, if if you're going to use an, an amplification mechanism that has serious fucking potency, when it comes to not just changing your own subjective universe, but potentially transforming the subjective universe of the entire planet through your podcast, your music, your vlog, your blog, your YouTube video, whatever it may be. And you have not in some way, shape or form cultivated the slightest compassion so that your intention and motivation behind doing that is more than just fucking spinning the jack in the box, jack in the box. Mm -hmm. And watching the snake pop out or the monkey pop out and laughing when people go, holy shit. You got to watch out because that's going to you're going to get you can get some real serious fucking karma for that. And I've experienced my own forms of karma for that. You know, mm. Magic's what, What's an example? Well, without getting too detailed, because I don't want to um, talk about anybody or anything, but like there, there in, in my young like I. You, you, you know, there's a few things that I have been taught from my magical teachers. The universe being one of my magical teachers, but one is don't cast love spells. Don't fuck with that. That's bad. That's really bad. And the reason it's bad is because it's non-consensual in a way. It involves another person. But then the other reason that's bad is um, because like the best way... It, you're basically like, so you meet someone and you get a crush on them, right? And you do, you do the classic thing when you're in high school or college and if you're a little goth motherfucker and you cast your love spell on the person, right? And it works. God forbid it should work. And now... It always works. That's well, always the first painful lesson. And, but here's the problem. It might have worked without the spell. Hmm. So now there's a cognitive dissonance that's coming from, wait... Ah, uh, yes. You know what I mean? Is this actually, was this going to happen anyway? Or did I use some sideways route to make it happen? So now you are, there's a little bit of self-doubt there just because right. the whole relationship is going to be shadowed by the spell. 
Two, if you did cast the spell, you got to tell him you did it. You know, if you don't tell him you did it, then now you're like have this secret. Now the relationship starting off with this really stupid secret, which is that you use magic to create the relationship. So now the whole relationship is founded on what relationships can't work. If there's in the fucking pillars of a relationship structural instability in the form of some big old secret that you can't tell it'll last for god it can last for a while man but boy those cracks are going to start showing and they're going to start showing in like weird fights you're getting in where you're like why are we even fighting what is this about well it's not about the fact that you put too much sugar on the eggs (laughs) or salt on the eggs or sugar in their coffee it's happening because two years ago you gave fucking Daryl a hand job when you were supposed to be monogamous. And you, and you know, it's not that big. Fucking Daryl always sliding always, in yeah, there with his yeah. manly jaw. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's not really that big a deal. Daryl doesn't give a fuck. And like, who gives a shit? She really loves you. But now she's got this awful shadow inside of her that she's not conveying to you. Or maybe you gave Daryl a fucking hand job. <laughs> you know it's what that I mean? jaw. Well, yeah, it's I mean, magnetic. Uh, well, it's the magnetic the shiny of Daryl. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like... Kind of, what, the manly Adam's apple. But what's that story where she like sells her hair and he gets the fucking brush or something? Oh, 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 oh yeah. The, the O. Henry story. Uh, Gift of the Magi. Yeah, so it's kind of like a hand job version of Gift of the Magi. <laughs> if you guys just the hand, had... The hand job of the Magi. The hand job of the Magi. <laughs> he says to her, I just want you to know I gave a hand job to Daryl. And I know you're probably going to break up with me. And she goes, oh my God. I gave a hand job to Daryl. <laughs> and he's like, what? Really? We both gave a hand job to Daryl? Let's call Daryl. And now it's the fucking threesome <laughs> of the match. <laughs> the point is. The moral of the story is be Daryl. <laughs> the, moral, the moral of the story no. is summed up in and in, in, in it is love everyone and tell the truth. And if, and, 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 and if you're going to do magic, follow those very simple rules, which is that if you're going to cast a magical spell, Tell yourself the truth and tell the person if you've cast a love spell, do do let them know that that's what you did. Don't hide it from them and don't cast love spells. How about this? How about trust that like if you fucking give up your idea of what love looks like in your life and create a vacuum that isn't filled up with the idol of the thing that you thought love should look like, nature abhors a vacuum. And that very well might fill in with something amazing. Right. Well, yeah, you also deprive yourself of the, of the, you know, the universe tends to provide the experience that is right for you, right? You deprive yourself of that. But I mean, this is absolutely a a problem on the magical path that is not as much, I mean, every path has its strong points and its weak points, right? So the mystic paths are not, don't quite have this weak point, but they do have the weak point of not enough self-autonomy where they have the mystic paths tend to have the weak point of too much guru, like too much expecting the guru to do things for you Mm. too much follower type behavior cultism on the magic path. People are much more hyper individualistic, so they don't as much have those problems, but the magical path does have the core issue of um, the lack of attention to the autonomy of other people. Right. Because the the whole yeah. like idea of magic is that you get some type of special ability, which is actually not true. You just become aware of how you're using your natural capability to manifest yeah. your life. But uh, because of the way it's been marketed or packaged in the past by previous people, uh, people get this kind of Hollywood idea that now oh, I'm, you know, now I am the wizard, you know, and they have the I have the power now. And um, that is an ego trap, obviously. So that's absolutely a problem. But and you dehumanize people. Or you just don't see them at all because you're so solipsistic. You're so focused on yourself. It's a big problem. Don't you think pickup artistry is a form of magic? Well, that's interesting. I was going to bring this up when you were talking about the love spell. You know, my analysis, of the, my analysis of the pickup artist thing is that it's a form of self-harm because for this reason, and it resonates with some of the things you were saying, um, with... So in in neurolinguistic programming, which is a very misunderstood science because it's can it's so easily and has so often been used for manipulation. Yeah. Neurolinguistic and it has been used by pickup artists. Neurolinguistic programming at its core is a therapeutic intervention method, and really it's for um, it's applied to yourself. I, it's like Photoshop for the mind. You know, it's it's a great technology for changing your own thinking around things. It's a great magical technology. It can you know 
really get people out of depression and cure lifelong phobias and change people's, you know, get people aligned with their true life path and all this stuff. If, you know, it's like magic, you know, there's, there's the, the, the good application and the wrong application right. or like anything. But in neurolinguistic programming, there's the concept presupposition, right? Which is, it's what you don't say. So in making a statement, <coughs> uh, what's an example? Like, uh, okay, just something really basic. If I say the couch is black, right? Yeah. Now, I, now I'm saying the couch is black. That's a very straightforward statement. There is a couch. It is a color. But there's also presupposition. So a presupposition is something that has to be true for this statement to be made in the first place. So it's something that's communicated without ever saying anything. So when I say the couch is black, um, there's some presuppositions there. The most obvious one, and I'm dumbing this down, but the most obvious one would be that a couch exists. Right. right. So in, in, instead of saying, if I ask, is there a couch, then in your mind, you're thinking there may or may not be a couch. If I say right. the couch is black, then I'm communicating you directly that there sure. is a couch and I'm communicating it in a way that your conscious mind can't resist. Right. right? There's automatic. There's now a couch. Yeah. Uh, that's a presupposition. So presuppositions are there are presuppositions on everything. There's presuppositions on ways to live your life. The presupposition of pickup artistry is that you need pickup artistry the presupposition before you get into any of those manipulative techniques whether or not they work is another question but the presupposition is that no one will love you without you manipulating them ah oh, yeah that's a great way to put it and that's yeah. why it's a form of self-harm because beautiful. what you're doing you think you're hypnotizing manipulating other people but what you're really doing is non-stop reinforcing the idea in your unconscious mind that you are not worthy of love, love, love unless it, you love manipulate it. people Genius. into it. That's great. That's the best way to put it. Exactly. That's great. Yes. And it's sad when you end up and it's just like you're fucking lonely, man. I get it. Loneliness is a fire. It's like being on fire. And it's like you'll do anything. Dude, I remember I was on tour with Natasha Leggero in, in the basement of our hotel. One of these famous pickup artists was doing a pickup artist seminar. I can't remember which one, but he was mentioned in the game. Did he have a big fluffy hat? They, don't they all have a fucking hat? Yeah. But I remember like he came out and, and he and, and he had a swarm of these people around him. Two people who were like, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, disabled in wheelchairs. There was a little person. Um, you know what I mean? There's people who are like really up against some like pretty tough uh road like really you look you look and you're like i get it i get it man like your body vehicle it's like fuck, man it's like what how do you like if you're if you half your body's paralyzed and you're in a wheelchair and you're lonely and you want to be touched how do you compete what are you going to do right and so i, I understand totally understand what well, going down that path and i you know as a person like that you might say to them yeah but you know this pickup artistry thing presuppose is like this idea implicit in it is that you don't desert you can't get love on your own and maybe someone who's like like that would say no shit man no shit look at me what if what would you do if you were me do you have an idea i've got a fucking one inch dick and I can't move my fucking hand, which doesn't have fingers on it. And I'm missing an eyeball. And I have fucking dentures in. What's your plan? What is your idea? What do you, you, got, you know a bar I can go to? Because if you do, I'll go right now. Otherwise, I'm sticking with fucking Gizmo or whatever the name Gizmo. is. You know, they give themselves yeah. names. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's, and this is, again, you know, everyone needs love, right? This is core to every single human being. Yeah. And, there's a certain point where it's like, yeah, I mean, people need to, well, hmm. have it's you looked problem. at the incel thing though? That's what I was thinking about when I was saying that is like, yeah. you look, but the weird thing about the incel thing is a lot of these incels, when I was going through the incel, an incel, not, not like I am an incel, but a phase of being like, oh my God, as many of us have. And you look at the videos of some of the incels, is there bitching about their like, you know, how like, oppressed they are by the chads right right and right. like and 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 a lot of these dudes who are giving the youtube speeches they're symmetrical and they're smart they're pretty you know like 
you look at them and you're like, what? Do you know who ContraPoints is? No. Oh my God. You got, so this is a, my favorite YouTuber of the moment. <laughs> so ContraPoints is a uh, M to F trans uh, woman from Baltimore who does the most hilarious like anarchist critique videos of all cool. time on YouTube. And they're like incredibly well produced because she's got a ton of Patreon supporters. She did one about Jordan Peterson where she was like seducing a cutout of Jordan Peterson, like in a bathtub and uh, talking about radical, uh, radical critique theory with him. It was, it was amazing. Um, but she did. She just did. I like about- Peterson, by the way, everyone's got mad at me because I have Peterson on my website and like, I don't a lot of some of the things Peterson says, like and with that article where he's talking about enforcement and monogamy or whatever, like that shit. I don't like that at all. Like some of the stuff he says, I don't like some of the stuff he says. I do like, right. You know what I mean? I'm like, I ended up like getting in like trouble with dear friends of mine whose opinion I really trust. He's like, well, you know, that guy, why, why'd you, why, we, first of all, we just talked about religion. It was really beautiful. A lot of his ideas on religion, particularly his ideas of his like, uh, ideas on like, uh, stalinism and like the spread of communism and all mostly though is like ideas of free speech uh and 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 um you know he i guess you could say and i don't know maybe he would disagree with me uh, i think you could call him a polemicist couldn't you he like uh, now maybe he would disagree with me and say he's a he's like a truthist or he's a uh what's the word a uh you know just somebody who's like an uh, someone who like is all for free speech and like i don't know man it could pop up. There's some skeletons in Jordan Peterson's closet that I don't know about, or who knows? Maybe there's something in there that, like, I'm not seeing or a blind spot or whatever. But fuck, man, come on. Jordan Peterson's highly entertaining. Like, like if we're gonna look at it objectively, you gotta admit the guy's entertaining, right? And then, secondly, you gotta admit there are some things he says that are pretty true. As far as I'm well, well, here's the thing with Jordan Peterson. I mean, I, I've gotten in trouble because uh, I've posted many inflammatory things about uh, Jordan Peterson and gotten into I've gotten mobbed by the lobsters, as I put it. But Why do you call them lobsters? The uh, the um, you know, because he's got his whole lobster dominance hierarchy uh, <laughs> theory. Um, which of course he left out that lobsters also, we want to look at scientific studies. Lobsters also pee in each other's faces to establish uh, territory. So, uh, or excuse me, no, they pee out of their faces. Don't they live forever too? Mm, no, I heard lobsters live forever. Like, crust, yeah, look it up. I think lobsters are immortal. Like some of them can live forever. They have this, look it up and I'm even joking. I will definitely look that up. Um, my feeling about Jordan Peterson and having read his books, uh, or excuse well, excuse me, having read Twelve Rules for Life and looked at him very fairly closely, is the th- here's my here's my analysis of Jordan Peterson. If we're we're, we're, we're going to get into this, eighty percent of what he says is completely spot on, right? So it, a lot of the places in Twelve Rules for Life, which is not a particularly well written book, but there's some good there's some really good core life advice in there. Yeah. For most of that, what he's doing is functioning as a very good therapist, which is a ther- a good therapist in many cases does the job of reparenting, which he's doing with his audience. He's saying like, no, there are boundaries. We need to enforce boundaries on life, right? right. Like you need to clean your room, clean, right? Clean your room or, or which is a glib way of saying, you know, that you need to have a structure for your life. Yeah. You need to, and there's so many things in that book that are just spot on advice that certainly would have helped me a ton if I had read it 10 years ago. For instance, stay away from friends who are a bad influence for you. Yeah. Get away from people who are going into the void and and establish structure and meaning for your life. And if you and if you can use the archetypes and stories of the past as a guidepost to do that, then that's yeah. great. That all that stuff is I 100 percent agree with. Yeah. Then there's the 20 percent where he says there's a conspiracy of postmodern neo Marxists taking over academia that we need to push back against with all of our might. Well. To me, that sounds quite a bit like the theory of cultural <laughs> Marxism, which is a, a constant trope of the far right and is actually a conspiracy theory from established by the Nazi party. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying Jordan Peterson is a Nazi because I don't think he is. However, I also have to look at his public um, persona and the fact that he quite often retweets things from uh, public think uh, think tanks and groups um, funded by the Koch brothers. You know the Koch brothers? Yeah, sure. 
So there's a lot going on there. He's done videos with Prager U, you know, like uh, who's Dennis Prager is this crazy far right guy. I mean, he's literally he was they were paying for YouTube videos for him being on or YouTube ads for him saying that, like, your children are being taught by postmodern neo-Marxists and we must overthrow it, not overthrow it. You know, we need to kick these people out, these people out of the school system. And for me, it really begins to verge on my my take on Jordan Peterson is that he really is a point guard in the cultural war of the right retaking cultural space in America and the way that they've convinced. I mean, look, look, I mean, let's look at it this way. A few years ago, people were dying uh, or not dying, but people were, you know, fighting at Standing Rock. The counterculture was extremely anti-corporate and in the yeah. last few years, all of that has been rolled back somehow. All these people who are basically uh, far right spokesmen have been marketed to young people as, oh, no, listen to this person. In a way, I look at Jordan Peterson and his he's got this kind of rap of, oh, no, don't look at social problems. Don't look at anything that's going wrong in the world. Go Clean your room. Look at yourself. Well, this is the same game that COINTELPRO played with the um, counterculture in the 60s. Right. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't riot. Don't revolt. Don't question the war. Uh, Don't talk about social inequality. No, do drugs. Go internal. Focus on yourself. Mm. Focus on enlightenment. Now, that's a little bit glib for me to say because I also talk about self-improvement and self-development and meditation and things like this. But there's a way where you have to take three steps back from Jordan Peterson and say 80% of what he's saying is completely accurate and is good and healthy for people to listen to. And yet there's also this political agenda on it, which absolutely serves the powers of the be. Okay. So look, the truth is I don't, you know, I don't know that. I do know that like he has retweeted people I disagree with. And I do know that there's aspects of what he says that like, I just don't, ag- I don't agree with it. Like also I haven't spent as much time studying him as you have, but um, what I love about him and um, is that, that his, and he encourages this kind of dialogue. He wants this. He he seems to be vehemently opposed to anything that would limit the way that we're talking right now. Like, I think that I could sit across from Jordan Peterson and say, hey, man, that enforced monogamy shit, I don't like that. What about the Koch brothers? Cultural Marxism. Have you heard of this COINTELPRO? Whatever. And I think that, like, he would, like, freely discuss it with me in a way that was like based on like how he actually felt. Now that might be naive. I don't know. But in the, the thing about the universities in particular, we got to watch out, you know, cause like definitely in universities, what can happen is imbalance, which you don't want, you know, like I, I want the whole fucking like picture in a university, meaning like I want somebody like Jordan Peterson who's like a firebrand, who's like causing controversy, who has the uh, potential to like draw cult followings. And I want somebody like the opposite of fucking Jordan Peterson, who I can't think, I don't know, that might be a true Marxist. Like in my college, there was like, there wasn't fucking cultural Marxists. There were fucking Marxists. Yeah, mine too. Marxist feminists. They They said they were Marxists. They weren't tiptoeing around the fact that they were fucking Marxists. They're like, we're Marxists. We're going to show you how to like march against the school of America's. You're going to get arrested. That was Warren Wilson college. Right. And they also had their professors who were like, what are you doing here? This school is useless. I had a, I had a professor, this wonderful professor, Bill Mosier. And I remember the first day of his class, he looked at the whole class sitting around a tree, liberal arts style. And I remember he said, drop out. He's like, I know what you're thinking. Like, I'm not like, I don't mean it. I mean it. Drop out. It's going to get you a lot of debt. If you really want to like learn, go to India, drop out and go to India, use the money to go to India. The, the, the class was called introduction to Southeast Asia. In the first day of class, he was saying, drop out of school and go to India. <laughs> right. And that's really not who you want teaching. I mean, that's, that, that was, let me put it this way. That's not a voice that you'd want to go unbalanced, right? Because that's actually terrible advice to give to somebody. 
I mean, really, well, okay. I mean, it depends on what your life path is, but I mean, really, it's so irresponsible to say that to somebody at the beginning of their life when it's really, I mean, like the advice I would give is like, figure out what you're good at, what what you want to do and get really, really good at it. The point is like a a, a university, I want it to be a fucking buffet. Sure. And I want in that buffet, Jordan Peterson. I want in that fucking buffet, someone like truly all like a, a fucking like nut. You know what I mean? Alex, fucking throw like Alex Jones in the buffet, right? And then, but let's also throw in some people in the buffet who are masters of logic. And so that, so that they can teach students like, okay, here's how you study sources. Here's how you filter out that 20% of bullshit. Here's how you decide how to react to this shit. Yeah, aside from absolutely. doing the thing people have done with Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson's followers, which is to say, oh, fuck that. Keep him away. He's going to chin to da 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 And, <clears throat> you know, um, I say, you know, another person from Warren Wilson College, Sam Scoville, he used to, when he was teaching classes, he would say, listen, man, I can listen to the most fundamentalist Christian radio. And I can pull from that really good information oh, yeah. from my life. Absolutely. This is what we need. I, I think yeah. people need to be taught, right? Which is like, learn how well, to people be need own. to be taught how to learn right and that's kind yes. of the idea of university it's people should not be spoon-fed what to believe they should be given the tools to become lifelong learners and be able to, to figure out what's true that's and right. not true for themselves and man they're not getting the, i mean what do you need to do that you need to learn logic you need to learn the scientific method you need to learn media <laughs> literacy yeah people aren't getting these as much anymore certainly not as much in high school but the thing is that i guess maybe to take a more wide angle on this right now the question of free speech and the universities and social media backlash and identity politics, all of which is kind of a big ball of wax all kind of lumped together. Like this is taking up so much of the cultural dialogue right now. Yes. But I try to zoom out a bit and think is, you know, look, we might lose earth in this generation. You know, the animals are dying. The biosphere is dying. Yes. Um, we're facing structural problems as a species that if we don't sort them out now, will not get sorted out. Um, and why are we talking about, why Why is all of a sudden uh, issues of, why are these issues taking up all the airwaves when the issue should be, fuck man, the ship is sinking and we need to plug the hole and we need to like at least temporarily overcome our differences. We can fight but later. Is the ship a man? What? Is the ship a man or a woman? <laughs> Why do we name our ships after women? <laughs> the ship's fucking sinking. Yeah, I know the ship's fucking sinking, but it's like, come on, do we have to name the ship after women? Like, come on, why are we calling her a she? She's right. sinking. What do you mean she's sinking? She doesn't have genitals. Did the ship choose her fucking gender? What is, what's happened? The ship is fucking sinking! It doesn't matter. Right. right. So for me, I mean, I have to look at these things, and these things are not <laughs> apolitical, right? Particularly, you know, the Koch brothers have put millions of dollars into climate change denial campaigns and t- taking money from big oil and making the world safe sure. for big industry. And so to have somebody so regularly retweeting things from Koch brother initiatives, it's not apolitical. That's all I'll say, you know, and for me in my life, uh, you know, I'll say this for me, my goal, my political goal is the survival of humanity, right? Uh, because we've, we're out of time for anything else. We, we just are right. Um, you know, I'm not interested in if the if what <coughs> side of the chessboard wins. I'm interested in the board staying intact so the game can continue. Right. And for me, I think that it is. Um, a f- well, I'll start with the left. I think it's a shameful failure of the left to not be focusing on the these core issues. Or even you know, like we could lose Roe v. Wade this year. You know, so and, and yet all the fights are all the fights are happening about side issues in, in my now. Now, immediately people can say, what do you, well, you, you know, easy for you to say that's a side issue, right? Like, how dare you? But um, this is how I feel. I mean, I, I and I always look at, you know, anyone in the public eye. There's going to be money behind them. Right. Know? Well, I right? mean, the, Jordan Peterson aside, the. To me, it's it, one one great thing to analyze uh, and, and analyze is the structure of the dialogue. And like you know, you, you, you and I, when we talk, 
the reason we like ch- chatting with each other is because there is a feeling of like, what's the truth? Let's see if we could like find the truth here as we, as we explore things. I want to find the truth. When I'm talking to my friends, I want to find the truth. Right. Science was all about finding the truth. Like, let's find the truth. Like, I propose a hypothesis, right? And then in this hypothesis, if I if we do a good study, and I'm shown to be wrong, and you're a scientist who like help me be show how wrong I was, then we've still found out something, which is that that hypothesis is fucking wrong, man. Right. And that's still knowledge gained. And we've won together, even though I wasn't right. (laughs) Uh, Winning together. What a concept. Yeah, exactly. Shocking. That was the idea. Now, the idea is not that for a lot of people. The idea is I want to be right, even if I'm wrong. And the way that we're determining right is not through some system, but through a kind of like horrific mob, mob rule, which is that... If, you know, for example, like, you know, I say, uh, yeah, I, you know, I like Jordan Peterson. Don't agree with everything he says, but I, I like him. You know, I I think he's cool. Some of the stuff, I don't know. And I agree with you. Some of the shitty retweets is like, really? I don't know why you're aligning yourself with that. But I like him. I think he's cool. I'd go to dinner with him. I think he's cool. Sure. So I say that, right? Now, what's inevitably going to happen is because I didn't say I completely like Jordan Peterson, potentially, there's going to be some Jordan Peterson likers who are like, dude, come on. What the fuck, man? He really meant this and that and that, right? But then sh- Haven't you watched all of his videos, Duncan? That. And no, the answer is no. I just like, you know, he's I find him to be really entertaining and and, and I and I've I really am grateful to him for doing my podcast and also I'm grateful right. to him for introducing me to Solsta Nietzsche. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gulag yeah. Archipelago, which I've I'm I'm really enjoying. So, okay, so that being said, on the other side, there's going to be people like, you motherfucker, to say your fucking language. Are you an all right person now? You're in the fucking da, da, da. <laughs> Right? And now and now with them, because I've gotten in these kinds of, I, I don't do it anymore, but I've gotten in these like debates with people where I really have thought, okay, we're going to get in a conversation. And at the end of the conversation, if I'm wrong, I'm going to be like, I'm wrong. Huh? Like the shit you're saying about the Koch brothers, I can tell you this, I don't know. But if he's paid off by the Koch brothers or if there's some money connection through some superfluous, or if there's some distant tertiary thing, I'm not going to be afraid to be on my podcast. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? I didn't know this guy was connected to some kind of movement to disseminate anti-science data into the world. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know that for sure, by the way. That, I'm, I'm just... Um, although I, although certainly he did do these commercials for PragerU, which presumably he was paid for. And I mean, he was paid by Monsanto to give their employees a lecture about the danger of identity politics. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, saying my feelings about what I've seen. I don't know for sure whether you, you ever know, met anybody who works at Monsanto. I have not. I can remember being all puffed up about fucking Monsanto and the Uber driver that picked us up in Hawaii worked at Monsanto. It's her job. She starts explaining the division of Monsanto she's in. And it was like, oh, God damn it. Of course, Monsanto is not all evil. Even though I'm, to this day on my podcast, just to rile people up, I'll say episodes are sponsored by right, Monsanto. Because right, right, right. it's hilarious. But here's the thing, man. To me, what used to happen and needs to still happen is we need to be happy when we're shown that we're wrong oh yeah yeah absolutely you know that's all if we're shown that we're wrong then we can adjust and 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 if we admit like oh yeah i was fucking wrong the response should not be you're a fucking idiot right it should be hey no no that's great right right you know now we've adjusted now we're getting closer to the truth that's all absolutely and you know as as hegel (laughs) the philosopher hegel would have put it you need Here's actually the thing. I mean, if you study the Hegelian dialectic and things like this, you need op- opposing viewpoints in order to get new syntheses where you, where you will yes. get new ideas. So you need like a, you need and that's kind of what's happening right now. I mean, we're having this crazy polarity between far left, far right. And people yeah. seem to be trying to go as extreme as they can possibly get in both yeah. directions. Um, but you need opposing ideas to come together to butt heads in a way in yeah. order to produce new syntheses that will lead culture forward. That's how you get new ideas. Sure. At least this is the Hegelian theory about it. Um, but I think that 
you know, I, I did a podcast with my friend Marty Beckerman, who's been a, a journalist forever, and we were talking about the expectations versus reality of the internet, right? And it was exactly what you were just saying about this idea that we're both seeking truth together. The expectation with the internet is that it was going to bring everyone together, and I'm sure you remember all the rhetoric about the global village and the information yeah, superhighway yeah. and all that. We were going to be one big community, and the assumption was you know, people would be seek, seeking truth together. And the reality is that has that has happened in, and we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which that has happened, but also the opposite has happened. And, you know, I, I think that not even know, the opposite, something worse than the opposite. Hmm. So, Just which, disintegration. Did, 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 like intentional info warping by right. states, concerted info warping by governments states principalities corporations using the the and it's not like that wasn't happening before but but it's this being is a whole new level technologically right? amplified which is like so 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 it's like dude weekly world news it used to be the best do you remember weekly oh world yeah news? that boy my aunt used to have a stack of fucking weekly world news back when i was too young to know this is bullshit and i kind of even knew it was bullshit then but i'd flip through the weekly world news read some re- ridiculous story about some insane fucking Nosferatu found in a cave <laughs> up and wherever. And I would be like, my God, what a great, great world this is. But it wasn't true, right? It just wasn't true. But I hadn't, didn't have the info immune system yet to know this isn't true, right? Now we're looking at the news. Old fucking Blitzer comes hobbling out. Wolf Blitzer, right? He's wearing his goddamn nice ass suit. And he's talking the truth. It seems like it's the truth, right? And you look at it, it's like, well, it must be the truth. And then Hannity, dear God, Hannity <laughs> looks like somebody turned an eagle into a human. <laughs> he's like the dream of all conservatives, right? right? The, like the great yeah. spokesperson for conservatives, right? That guy fucking comes out. If you don't have the immune system and this noble eagle man <laughs> is bugling out the glories of the president, right? And you haven't just thought that dude's making a lot of fucking money. Speaking of like, we don't know who's getting paid by who, but dude, Fox News, Fox, Rupert Murdoch, we know that money's coming from a lot of weapons manufacturers right. and probably CNN too, right? Oh yeah, that's non-partisan. But that, see, that's the thing about big business. I mean, big. you saw it with Elon Musk recently got into to heat because he was shown to have been uh, donating to the Republican Party. But all these guys like Facebook, they donate to both sides because they want to keep the wheels of commerce greased and going yeah. no matter who's in office. Yeah, they want to have friends on both sides. Yeah, But it's like, you know, the point is you fucking realize like, all right, well, I definitely know the money from the news is coming from people who like to blow up kids and make money blowing up kids. No question about that. So so I know for sure that, you know, God, this guy is, I get a lot of information from Uber drivers, man. But this one Uber <laughs> driver was telling me, if you make umbrellas, you need it to rain. And if you're selling weapons, you need there to be war. Right. And if the thing that produces the reality tunnel or what we call mass, the for the masses, which is the news, is being paid by people who make weapons, then for fucking sure, the message being sent by those people is going to be warped in a way that makes us at least kind of okay with blowing people up. Right. Right. Or if the money is coming from oil companies, don't you think it? It's, there's a slight chance that the message might be, oh, no, 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 don't participate in countercultures that uh, might do something like protest Standing Rock. Don't do that. No, no. Focus on cleaning your room. Which I don't, again, I don't think, that I think, first of all, the problem is, I think cleaning your room, if you want to fucking be a nice little revolutionary comrade, clean your fucking room. <laughs> or if you want to be a nice fucking alt-right fascist pig, clean your fucking room. <laughs> Either way, clean your fucking room. Or get a, get a floor cleaning robot. Yeah, or yeah. get a floor cleaning robot, or, or like if you have some money, get someone to clean your room for you. But the point is like, get your affairs in order, get organized, get focused. Mm. If you want to be a good activist on any side of the spectrum cleaning your room is great fucking advice so i think that like though you know maybe there was some subversive movement telling people clean your room instead of protest i would say if you want to be a great protester revolutionary and your fucking room's a mess Hmm. and you're smoking and there's cigarettes fucking everywhere and you can't control yourself then you fuck you you're not going to be a great revolutionary anyway so jordan peterson's advice is a double-edged sword Oh, well, like I said, I mean, I agree with 80% of what he says. I think it's absolutely spot on life advice. Clean your room. Burn a flag. I don't care. <laughs> clean your room. Read fucking mind. Just clean your fucking room. That's mm. the point. And because if, you know, if we can like 
begin to, um, in some way, shape, or form, discipline the wild, wild, primordial hive of personalities that any individual is, then we'll get, we're going to be more successful in our manifestation of whatever the particular thing is we want to see manifest. Right. That's all. Well, you know, in the, the early, just a, a bit ago, we were talking about, just a bit ago, we were talking about um, technology and wisdom, right? And you were talking about the evolution of the, the psychedelic counterculture. And one thing that was coming to me is, you know, you were talking about the failures of the psychedelic counterculture in the 60s. And one thing that was coming to me is the there's a wisdom arms race in a way, mm. right? Yogananda said, uh, and Manly P. Hall also said at the beginning of the century that mankind's uh, capacity for creating destruction and weapons of mass destruction was far outpacing its capacity for wisdom. And so I think what we're all engaged with at the moment, uh, you know, whether it's uh, on the right with Jordan Peterson or on the left or, you know, anyone who's trying to get advanced wisdom, I think is good. Right. And because we need it in order to cope with just the onslaught of technology. Yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, and, that's got to start with you, you know, and and then don't trick yourself into thinking, oh, I'm just working on myself and therefore I'm helping everything, you know, because it, it, that can be a great tool to imagine that, like, at some point you do need to, I mean, the way my guru says it, Neem Karoli Baba, if, you know, people would ask him, how do I raise my kundalini? And he would say, feed people, you know, so it's, it, 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 there is a thing that's like, okay, or, or a better thing than we said on my podcast Robert Thurman, when he started, when he talked at the Ramdas retreat I was at, he's like, practice, practice, practice. Everyone's always talking about practice. He's like, I want to see someone fucking perform for once. Right. And it's like, don't trick yourself into, don't just like, you know, or another, uh, 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 for me, you'll hear people will say, like, you know, I'm going to do stand up after I finish writing these great jokes. And I have been taught, and I always tell them, don't fucking wait to get on stage until you have a good joke. That is like waiting to go fishing until you've caught a fish. It's like you need to get on stage and do the fucking work and then the jokes will come. So it's like in the same way with social action, clean your fucking room, but you, there's other shit you can do too, you know, that, that like is going to help the world. And maybe just one little thing is like, God damn it, man, let's figure out a better way to talk to each other online. Mm. You know, let's, it's so simple and obvious, but let's figure a better way to like connect that isn't with the, with the possibility that maybe people are a little right and a little wrong. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's like Ken Wilber said, like, you know, everyone, well, a couple things. I mean, like everyone is right to some extent, everyone, right? And everyone's wrong to some extent. Also, people are doing the best they can with the tools they have. That's it. Yeah, that's right. right. That's but right. we all have different tools and we're, we're coming from different places. For instance, I'm coming from the Black Towers of the Sorcerers, which I hope you've enjoyed your time in. Duncan. I love it, man. You're the best. <laughs> I love these conversations, Jason. I'm really lucky to have you as a friend. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for joining me here in my, in my uh, Cyclopean Spires. Ah, all hail Malak. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Ooh, brother. Okay. Hope you really enjoyed joining in my conversation with Duncan. I wish I could have made fish tacos for you also, but hopefully this podcast episode is, is enough of a gift for me to you. So definitely make sure to get subscribed to the podcast if you aren't already. You can subscribe at the show webpage, which is jasonlube.com slash podcast. And you can find links there to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and lots more. And you can also become a Patreon supporter there to make sure the show keeps going and give a little love back. And of course, Patreon supporters get advanced access to new episodes of the show as soon as the interviews are recorded. So you'll get the drop on new interviews way before everybody else. You'll also get access to our Discord and special elite status on the Discord including access to a special forum where you can make requests uh, for the podcast that I'll be looking at very, very closely. Okay, so until next time, lots of love, I honor you, and be good. <laughs>